Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 147 for Wednesday, January 3rd, 2018. folks and happy new year here we are on gig gab the podcast by for and about working musicians and here in chile durham new hampshire i'm dave hamilton you're in las gatas california it's paul kent happy new year dave happy new year paul it's good to talk to you man you too man did you have a nice new year's eve uh i did um it actually you know that was one of the topics i wanted to talk about today because i had that gig at midnight new year's eve oh yeah yeah and it, and the gig went really really well. It was a whole lot of fun, and um, and actually lots of stuff happened. I mean, it, the crowd was uh, well lubricated by the time they they filled the theater. Uh, not surprising. And there were you know, and that that show it was the Rocky Horror Show. So that show is all about the crowd interaction. I mean, the crowd is sure. as much, the crowd is its own character. And there were some characters in the crowd, including actually a good friend of mine, Chris, who uh, is part of the theater crowd, but didn't do this show. And evidently he came in with the uh, intention. He usually plays the narrator, which is of course the character that gets the most grief or one of the characters that gets the most grief from the crowd. So he came in uh, looking for revenge as it were. (laughs) And that made, it just made things interesting. I mean, it was just, you know, it was a loose gig. It was a sweaty gig again, which was good, but um, it, you know, it's great working with it's effectively a rock band, but all musicians that, can read and, you know, are used to sort of the theater vibe because about 20 minutes before we went on stage, um, we, you know, we were talking about how, how the opening of the show was going to go and, and this, that, and the other thing we thought, well, when the crowd, there's this thing where, you know, that somebody comes out, explains the rules to the audience, can't touch people. You can't throw things at them, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then they get they, they start it with this whole give me an R R give me an O and then they start chanting Rocky Rocky and that's when the show starts and we decided well that's when we should play like a rocked up you know one pass through all Lang Syne and Miles one of the the keyboard players was like oh I, I have the sheet music for that upstairs so he went and got it and I was like okay well what key is it in it's like well. It's, you know, a half step out from where we would need it to be so that the last note of Auld Lang Syne is the first note of the, you know, the song that that starts the show. And uh, so everybody was like, yeah, no problem or whatever. And everybody transposed it real quick and and off we went. And it we never rehearsed it. It worked actually perfectly because mm. we just talked it through and everybody understood exactly what was going on. So it was fun. That that part of it um, was was it was a nice way to, you know, to start the start the night <laughs> that's cool yeah excellent yeah and yeah. new year's eve for me was weird this is my first new year's eve off in many years and we took it off well there's a couple things <clears throat> one is you know steve's been healing so we as a band agreed to take the balance of the year off so we you know the house rockers have not been together i mean they played my daughter's wedding in the middle of october i didn't i wasn't really part of that i played one right. a couple songs right it's been three months since i played with the house rockers which is crazy i am like I've been crawling up the walls. We had our first rehearsal last night, which I'll tell you about in a second. But um, but we uh, the the New Year's gig that we've had, the New Year's Eve gig that we've had the last couple of years. I um, was pretty aggressive with the um, the guy who hosts the event uh, financially, and I and, you know this was a lesson. We priced ourselves out of it, right? Uh, so yep, yep. So you know, I went pretty hard, and you know, tried to get the guys more money, and and uh, and the guy surprisingly didn't negotiate. So actually what I was anticipating was I, I asked for a pretty big raise and I figured he would meet me in the middle somewhere. And he actually more got, uh, got a little miffed about, about the premise of the, of the ask. Right. Which was right. interesting to me because we've sold so many tickets for the guy. I would think a business response would be, well, you know, this is a negotiation. But sometimes it's not a negotiation. I don't really know much about the guy who hosts the event. He, you know, he has a day job and, you know, these, these uh, special event 
I think he does a New Year, uh, Valentine's Day and he does a Halloween. He has a deal with a hotel, you know, and uh, and he brings these things in. But there was no negotiation because oh, we'll pass this year. And and that was kind of interesting for me. And uh, so it just kind of huh. kind of died like that. So the lesson learned there, you know, you got to really feel out the people that you're if you want to negotiate with someone, get as much information you can about their ability, willingness, style yeah. to negotiate before you assume that it's going to be a negotiation. But this is a guy that you've, I mean, this isn't the first time you've worked with this guy either. I mean, it, it, at some level, you have to trust your gut that, okay, yep, this is what I'm going to, I'm going to do. And, and, but you have to know what the risks are, right? That you yeah. can lose the gig or whatever. I, I would say though, I, I mean, certainly your, your, your words of warning are wise, but I would say that your ten, uh, your tendency to choose to negotiate here is not isolated to this particular guy. It's it, it's you, right? So you have your way of doing business. And my guess is that over the last, whatever it is, is it 17 years you've been doing the House Rockers now? Yeah, yeah, 19. 19, okay. That that has served you and by proxy the House Rockers quite well. And so by losing this one gig, it's like, okay, well, you know, okay. The two styles didn't meet, but, you know, the style has worked for you over the years. I, you know, I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't sweat it too much, but. I'm not sweating it. I mean, again, it's just a lesson learned. It was like, you know. I thought I knew. And again, oftentimes you make decisions based on what you think, you know, only to be sure. proved wrong. Oh, of course. Right. And so, of course. and so, you know, the data there was like, we killed it the last two years. We sold, you know, our, we drew huge. Mm -hmm. So I think it was a pretty educated, a guess to say, Hey, let's enter into a negotiation. It should be better. And it was just a weird thing. Maybe he was having a bad day. Maybe yep. he had a brother who had a band who wanted to play the gig. I, you know, I, I don't know, but um, you know, those things happen. And again, you live and learn. I haven't, I'll follow up with the guy and see how it went with him and see if he wants to have a new discussion for next year. You know, remember nothing is ever dead, right? No, not, That's there, true. It, right. It, yeah. As long as you can take emotion out of it, uh, then nothing is ever dead. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, there's always next year and, you know, there's always, you know, something else coming on. So, yeah. again, it was just a lesson learned. It was an interesting thing. But I will say this. So we had kind of a mellow New Year's Eve to begin with. Uh, we had some friends over. And then uh, in San Jose, California, there's a big uh, open park in the middle of downtown. And they uh, do a big Christmas decoration. And then they last couple of years, they've been doing a New Year's Eve thing. So amidst all the end of the holiday decorations, they have a stage and uh a great local band, Sage, who I've talked about on the show quite a few times. They played. They did two sets, a 9.30 to 10.30 and then an 11.30 to 12.30. We went down and caught the 9.30 to 10.30. And again, I, I'm going to talk about Sage a little bit because Sage is the band that That's I've shared here. That's new drummer, this. right? That's my new drummer, right? Yeah. So, you know, I went to see Russ play uh, and uh, show respect because Sage, you know, it was was uh, was retiring after 48 years as a band. And, they, you know, they were great. They were on fire. They knew it was a very meaningful way that they wanted to go out. And so the band just sounded awesome. And so it was fun. Actually, we stayed, we saw the first set. I said, hi to the guys. And uh, that was part one. And then we went to a local restaurant that had another buddy, buddy of mine playing. It killed me not to play. I got to say, <laughs> it, it gets it. And then it gets in your head because then you realize all your friends are playing. Yeah. And, you know, and, you know, it's New Year's Eve is a working night for musicians, right? There's a totally. lot of gigs, totally. every restaurant, every hotel, lots of country clubs. I mean, there's lots of places to go. And, uh, you know, a working band should be working on New Year's Eve. And it was really uh, you know, humbling, you know, to, to be on the sidelines for this one. So, you know, determined to make sure we get a really good one next year and, uh, or, or maybe do our own. We, I'm going to think about that and yeah. we'll talk about that. But, uh, yeah. So New Year's Eve was some good music to listen to. Um, you know, a reflection that uh, negotiation is an ongoing skill to master. And, you know, I, I want to be in the game on New Year's Eve is definitely a lesson that I had. So this is interesting because I had uh, I had some very parallel experiences to you, although almost on the other side of it. Uh, the first is this is the first New Year's Eve that I've played in probably eight or nine years, maybe. I, mm. I got um, I sort of got burned out on the whole New Year's Eve thing. Um, it's always a messy night. It's always, I mean, you get paid well, right? There's nothing and, and I'm fine with it, but I don't know. I just, um, 
I, I kind of got burned out on the whole craziness of, of playing on New Year's Eve and everybody's really extra sloppy that night. Not the band, but, mm. you know, the, the crowd is extra sloppy and uh, and there's always expectations. And I, I and driving home is is always like, you know, you got to worry about who else is on the road on New Year's Eve. Well, that's for sure. And, yeah. and But the last two years that we've done, so I haven't had any of those things. So it's been a nice like hotel gig. Mm. People dressed up. And definitely it's getting a lot looser as the night goes on. Sure. But no more sloppy than a, than a normal nightclub gig, I would say. And, you know, maybe huh. less so because people are, you know, they're dressed up and, you know, there's after parties and all type of stuff. Yeah. No driving because we played it at a big hotel and then we stayed at the hotel. That's good. Which is an optimal situation. That's Yeah, that's and, good. That's good. Yeah. So, so, you know, I get what you're saying. And I've actually heard this. Joe, you know, my old drummer, yep. he definitely thought um, New Year's Eve was amateur night and just yeah. fraught with, you know, fraught yeah. with pitfalls. That's what. Yeah, that's what it is. It's the amateur night. But then I wound up in I didn't even realize a, a negotiation on New Year's Eve. So we did this Rocky Horror gig on Christmas and on Christmas we had a rehearsal booked before the gig and then the gig. Because we'd only had a few rehearsals up until then, and it was fine. And, you, you know, the way it, it works is I get paid per service. So Christmas night was a, a double paycheck, right? It was the rehearsal and then and then the gig. And when it was booked, New Year's Eve was an 11 p.m. call, which I was sort of worried about because trying to get parking in downtown Portsmouth at 11 p.m. on New Year's Eve was something I wasn't sure it was going to actually mm. work. But, you know, it was like, OK, well, I'll deal with that. You know, I'll get there. I'll plan to get there maybe a half hour early or whatever and just give myself time to, to find something. And uh, and I woke up on uh, on New Year's Eve day and checked my email and had the note that said, just a reminder, uh, everybody's on for an 8 p.m. call tonight for our rehearsal. It's like, wow, okay, how did I miss that? I went back through my notes, was like, no, these were all 11. Okay, well, whatever, I'm open, it's fine, I'll go. So I get there and I I just mentioned to one of the people, I'm like, did I miss something? They're like, no, you didn't miss anything. There was there was a breakdown in the communication. It It was never... You know, nobody was ever asked about this. It was just kind of assumed and and we apologize and thanks for being here. I was like, yeah, OK, great. And then I wound up talking to our our music director who for this show is actually a 17 year old kid. I think I've mentioned him before. This guy, Julius Laflamme, uh, mm -hmm. great player. And his I mean, he's 17, but his maturity it goes beyond his years. He's he's great. He's fun to play with. And it's it, it works out really well. We get along. And I just said to him as sort of the other band members were filtering in saying, wow, you know, they were all it's in the same boat. They're like, I had no idea we had this rehearsal. I'm like, yeah, well, you know what? It it doubles the paycheck for tonight. And suddenly there was this pregnant pause. <laughs> and uh, and Julia said, I, I don't know if it doubles the paycheck for tonight. And I said, well, it's supposed to, <laughs> you know, we were called for a rehearsal. He's like, right. I need to check on that for us. Right. And and so he did to his credit. You know, he found himself, especially for a 17 year old kid, that'd be it's an uncomfortable situation for anyone to find themselves in. You know, where he's not the one that called the rehearsal, but but he's the one coordinating it all. And so by the end of the night, it was all sorted out. They're like, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, you know, you get paid for the the the, the extra rehearsal and it's, not very it's good. fine. Yeah. Yeah. But I had you know, I didn't even say it. To, to be passive aggressive about negotiating. I just assumed it was taken care of like, oh, OK, I just missed out, you know. And in there, in that, what you just said is actually the, the most important thing. If you believe that your time has value and you've made an agreement for a specific number of X's, X hours, X days, X minutes, whatever it is, and um, and that changes, it's just common sense. Nobody should assume that it's just thrown in. Right. No. And if you're coming from a place where, you know, listen, I could be doing this or I could be doing something else. Right. And if you want me to be doing this above and beyond what we agreed to, of course, it's worth something else to you. Of so course I it's, think, yeah, it was a paid but path. It's, right. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, and it's just mostly that people are uncomfortable with assumptions that you kind of lean into. Yeah. Uh, well, what what's one more hour or what, you know, but it's never one more hour. Right. Nope. And so <laughs> it, it, the, the tool, you know, for musicians is like, if you believe your time is value and you have an agreement that's a very tacit agreement, this amount of service for this amount of money, it's okay 
to basically say respectfully, right. What you're asking for is outside of what we agreed to. How are we going to deal with it? Yeah. And then that doesn't mean you can't, you know, doesn't mean you have to say it's full scale. You're, no, it might, depending on your situation. Right. That's right. right. Yep. So, but it's mostly about being comfortable with, wait, we had an agreement. You were going to get X and pay Y and now you want X plus. And so the plus, you know, we got to figure out what we're going to do about it. It doesn't have to be contentious, nope. but it's, it, you know, as long as you're in agreement, and this kind of brings up a really interesting uh, thing that Simon and I are going through. We, um, we have gotten asked to do some acoustic dates at a really nice hotel. And um, there's like a personal relationship where we know the manager of the hotel and um, he offered a bunch of dates and Simon said, do you think we should do a contract for it? And like we've talked about here, contracts are good things, right? Yep. So we, you know, prepared a contract, sent it to the guy and the guy sent back a note and he said, well, here's the deal. We can do a contract if you want, but you're you're opening up a whole can of worms because once there's a legal document, I have to send it to my legal team and they, you know, are going to ask things like insurance and, you yeah. know, contractor type things. Are you sure you want to go down that road? Huh? And a, what, a, what an interesting negotiation tactic. He's not. I don't think it was a negotiation. I think well, it was, I think it was I think it was I think it was being very honest. He's like, we can do a contract if you want, but I work for a company, and companies have legal protections they that they need to have. So you know, there's one difference if it's a verbal thing under my personal budget that I can extend to you, and you're going to have my word, and you make a value judgment based upon how well you know the guy and his word. Yep. And then you know, but we've talked about here that a contract is always the thing that. You know, and so, you know, my advice is let's at least get something, you know, in email that's specifically what the dates are, what's, you know, what the pay is, what the, you know, meals or drinks or whatever, uh, and what the hours are. And let's at least have something that's agreed to in writing yeah. somewhere yeah. without it having an email, without it having to be a full contract, because that, that actually is the truth. I mean, we've had. Uh, we've had, you, you know, when we deal with civic um, entities, cities that want us to play for their town uh, music concerts. The different ones have different approaches to it. And some of them are asking for, you know, where's your liability insurance? Any contractor, they don't care whether you're a musician or a carpenter. If you're a contractor, you have to have liability insurance. Liability insurance. Absolutely. Most, most bands I know do not carry liability insurance. Does, does fling? No, no. Yeah. Did you with the house rocker? <clears throat> no, 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 absolutely. No. I mean, you know, yeah. and, and I state this up front and I think, like I said, the the request is usually coming from kind of a boilerplate contractors right. have, right? But you know, most musicians don't. Most carpenters do, <laughs> but uh, yes, most musicians is. don't. Yeah, and I've so, I've run into that. You know, uh, years ago was the first time, but you know, just even just doing like tech consulting for a bigger company. As soon as you put a yep. contract into place, it's all of those things. But one thing that's worth remembering that well, two things. Number one, if you have a contract. And you get to the point where you need to refer to it. Things have probably gone south. Right. And and so it's contentious. Usually, if you get to the point where you need to refer to it. So like when you need one, you know, things are already in a bad spot. But an email with follow up performance, i.e. an email where you say that, uh, you know, he's going to hire you and it's going to be whatever, 500 bucks to have the two of you play for three hours. And then uh, another email a week later confirming the dates or whatever, something that shows that th you put this agreement together and then there was a follow up on it. That follow up turns that original email into a contract. Now, mm. it might be a very unclear contract and there's going to be a lot of interpretation on that because you didn't write it all out. But if you had to take someone to court now, I don't know if it's worth taking somebody to court over 500 bucks, but if you had to take somebody to court, that email actually would hold up in that scenario. Most that's interesting. I'm, I'm no lawyer, but yeah, an email, even a verbal agreement with performance is a contract. The problem is it's really hard to, to, to objectively look at what the details of that verbal agreement actually were. Whereas emails much clearer because it's, it, it's written. So, well, like okay. you said, having something is the key, you it's know, having key. something yeah. that you can refer to. And you're right. If something goes South, you know, there are other problems. I often, <clears throat> Often for musicians, you know, one one bad deal isn't going to kill you. Right? right. So, you know, you show up and they say, never mind, we don't want you. Or the guy calls you two days before and says, we don't want you. And, I, you know, we've talked about those types of situations here. You know, you say, hey, you should make us whole. They say yes. They say no, whatever it is. 
but the situation is over and you don't trust the person again, if that's the way it's going to be. Right. Totally. right? So, yeah. you know, one, but you know, and if you, if you <clears throat> willingly go back into the same situation without some better understanding. So if you showed up for a gig like you have, and there's another band already setting up and the guy says, Oh, I really messed up. I promise not to do it again. Yeah. If you take, I promise not to do it again is good enough. It's really on you now as to whether it is, you know, like, like what did you do in that one time with the band when you, when it was double booked did, and you know, did you, did you change the structure of the agreement? Did you want something in email that had specifically said, Hey, if this, I guess he paid you that night. So it wasn't actually even a big deal, right? Yeah. Well, we played the gig and it turned out the club did not make a mistake. The club booked us. The other band made the mistake with their own. Ah. That that's how that worked out. So, but even then we still, uh, Mike had, uh, had texted with the owner. So, I mean, it was there in, in the text trail, which is just as good as an email, you know, and in terms of being clear with details, there's, there's the beauty of text in terms of it being, you know, black and white or green and white or blue and white, depending on what kind of phone <laughs> you have. But, uh, but you know, it, yeah. So there was no, there was no issue there, but, but I've been there before where we've booked gigs, you know, back in the, Pre cell phone days, I remember one club we played all the time, and we got there one night, and this woman's like, "Yeah, no, you, you're not playing tonight." It's like, "What are you talking about?" Like we booked all this stuff. She's like, "No, I, I, it's somebody else," and she had it was clear she had screwed up her calendar, but there was no, it was all done by phone calls back then, right, you know, right. which is often how it is now. But at least now, even with a phone call, you can often follow up with an email saying, "Hey, thanks for your time on the phone," just so we both have it. Uh, here, you know, I'm sending this out to you. Here's the, the dates that I've got and, and just making sure I got it all right. If you just take a look quick and, and confirm back with me, you know, we're good to go. And, and that, you know, that then not, a, it, it makes it a contract again. Hopefully you don't have to get to the point where you need to call it a contract, but sure. even somebody else, like even that act of sending them the email, they now see it. And if they're going to reply, they're bought in that extra level because th they know like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember seeing that. And if they screw it up, they're going to be like, oh, you're totally right. You know, it's it's a whole lot different and, and less nebulous when you can do something that way. So I agree. Yeah. So um, I did. I had my first rehearsal with the House Rockers in three months last night. And like I said, I was climbing the walls to play again. I mean, I miss the guys. I miss playing. I miss being on stage. And uh, it was fun to kind of see that the other guys were kind of reaching out as time was getting closer. Like they were climbing the walls, too. They, they were, Everyone was really ready to get back to work. And it was our first official rehearsal with Russ, the new drummer. Mm. And uh, we have a gig coming up in a week on uh, January 13th. And so I had to have, get a game plan together. So Russ subbed a couple dates for us. And so I took the last gig that he played with us and said, you played this gig and you knew those songs then. Do you know these songs now? And we went through the list. Yeah. And, you know, so, you know, we took that set list basically. Um, we also have one, like we're starting our process of adding new material. So, you know, kind of in parallel, the horn chart was ready. I had the guys prepare, you know, just at least a rough sketch of the rhythm chart. And we ran through that, which was kind of cool. We got halfway through the show. Um, you know, Russ is really a pro. So not only is he extraordinarily prepared, which is fantastic, but he comes and he asks the questions and he's really calm about it. He sits down and right before we play a note, let me just clarify a couple things. Yeah. And he had his list and he just checked them off and like, can we, and you know, there were like two or three endings that he felt a little ambiguous on. He just asked really, really smart questions. And then we sit down and, and you know, the playing was just great. It was just so fun. I mean, it probably, it probably was play was probably just okay. Cause it was the first time in so long, <laughs> I had to go over a lot of the songs cause I haven't, I haven't played with the guys in three months. So yeah. I had to go back and make sure I remembered them. And there were a couple of things that I definitely needed to polish up. Um, uh, the interesting thing. So the playing was just joyful and it was really fun. And I really excited about everything again. It's funny and fun and interesting with a new drummer. Um, he asked the question, you know, I'm not so-and-so. How much do you want me to try and be so-and-so? And, you know, our feedback was so-and-so is Joe, of course. Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the feedback was, you know, it's your chair, man. We chose you. And, you know, if something's real important to us, we'll let you know. But it's your gig to make it your own. Go find the you know things that you want to do. And if something's not working, we'll talk about it. But, you know, don't assume, don't assume, you know, let, when we get there, 
we'll we'll let you know if something's going on. So we play the gigs. That's, we play the rehearsal. First of all, that's a re- like I wish I had asked that question with Uptown Celebration at the first rehearsal. Mm. Not, not that there's ever been a problem, but there was this. It got to be like the third rehearsal, and I I I realized that. They were they were in I mean, you know, they were in panic mode because they had gigs coming up that Gary, sure. like I said, was opening a restaurant. He didn't have a lot of time. So in in certainly in his mind, it was Dave's just going to be a drop in replacement for Jeff and not just drumming wise, but, you know, all the harmonies and, and everything that Jeff sang, which, of course, there was no roadmap for. Right? <laughs> so so I finally had to stop like three rehearsals in. I'm like, look, I'll do whatever you guys want, but. You have to tell me. Like, I can't yeah. guess. Read minds. Yeah. Well, I can't. I, I can actually read minds pretty well, like for music and stuff. But but, you know, I have no idea what this other guy actually did for you. So I can tell when you're not getting what you think you want. But I'm not exactly sure what that is. <laughs> like, you just need to tell me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And finally, so, they said, so, no, let's make you go ahead and make the gig your own. It, it was the same kind of conversation, good. but it I should have asked it early on. Russ is a very wise man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great drummer, wise man. Yeah. And so then then we're playing and actually some things. Here's a couple things. And he was very verbose about this, like. Some of these songs that I play with the house rockers, I've played with Sage for you know a number of years. That version is in the back of my head. <laughs> and so yeah. he's kind of dealing with that. He's dealing with the bootlegs of us that I've given him to think about and uh, and the originals that he's using to you know double check. One of the interesting things, actually the most interesting thing of the night for me was Brown Eyed Girl. So Brown Eyed Girl, you think about that, oh, you know, cover band staple, yeah. bar band staple, yeah. everything, right? Sure. I never realized he played something and I was like, what the heck is he doing? And um, he was like, that's, that's the part that's on the record. If you listen to it on the record and I've been playing it so long and Joe plays it very straight. Um, it was really interesting to me that I know that this exactly is on. what he's talking about too. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of, it kind of has this loping feel to it. It was really kind of interesting. And he, and, and this brings to my mind, like a couple of things. One, when you invite a new guy to join your band, and especially if it's a cover band, primarily if it's a cover band, because again, there are those things. What has he played before? Yep. What has the, what does the record actually do? And what are, what are you used to doing? So trying to draw a distinction between whether I like it or not, or whether it's just different is, is a really interesting thing. And this was a good example of that. Like he did this and actually at the, at the end I said, well, Russ, this is one of those things. It was weird for me to sing, sing over that different, groove yeah can you play it straight and i'm sure in his mind he was going i thought you told me i could make it my own (laughs) right (laughs) that's definitely what was going through his mind (laughs) right and so you know i I went home thinking about this and i'm like no no no." i also said you know if there's something that feels weird just you know sing over the singer is basically trump general direction on this type of stuff and he was cool about it looked right right. yeah he looked at me was like really that's what's on the record and um and I was like, yeah, can, you, can we just play it straight? But I'm <laughs> reflecting very strongly on better, worse, or just different and getting, you know, giving, giving the new guy a chance to be different. Yes. Like some of the stuff he did was, was wonderful. Like some of the tower, he's a great uh, funk groove drummer and, okay. you know, he nails tower of power stuff, you sure. know, like you, I mean, he just, all those kind of skippy type Garibaldi grooves. I mean, he's just wonderful at that type of stuff. And a lot of our tower stuff started popping in entirely new ways last night, which was really exciting. And, um, you know, but me, I'm the rock guy in the band and, you know, I'm used to very straight ahead, keep it simple, you know, uh, you know, let the let the complexity and the power come from the horns. And, you know, I'm, I'm just used to the grooves huh. and used to versus right, better, wrong. Right. So yeah, it was uh, it was just say, an interesting thing. I will say this. And, and obviously, Russ is coming from a band where he knows. It, I mean, they've been a successful band for a very long time, probably longer than he's played with them. Um, but he started the band. Oh, well, never mind then. OK, so he knows what he. He knows that we, we all know that what he does works, but I will say this as the drummer that has joined many bands and gone through some, you know, version of this with every single one of them, it, it, especially like you said, if it's a cover band, because there's always that. And your, your thought of, of let the complexity kind of move and happen, uh, you know, that can 
be the downfall of a band. And I have been the downfall of a band coming in, not even knowing like what it is that I'm doing different. But if you go from a drummer that's playing, you know, meat and potatoes, four on the floor, you know, that type of drummer to, you know, somebody like Russ, who sounds like he, he you know, at least on the funk side, he and I have some similarities there. Uh, you can the way I think about it is you can start playing for the band or you can start playing for the crowd. And that meat and potatoes thing is always for the crowd. And, mm. you, you know, so I, I try to be aware of this. And it, and like, I, I mean, I'm saying this more as a generalization for everybody listening. I, I, I'm not really worried about this guy, Russ, because it sounds like he's he's got plenty of, of history and experience to know, you know, what's actually going to work and what's going to be too much. But it, there is an amount of very, very good and correctness that can be very, very wrong for a given band. I, you know, I, and I've and I say this from, uh, you know, some some very uh, humbling personal experiences. Yeah. Like, no, I'm playing right. it right. Yeah. But the crowd's not moving, Dave. Oh, well, and that's a thing. Sometimes. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so I find that with complexity. Right. So complexity may be technically right. Correct. And again, Steve is a great bass player and, and he was listening really intently and finding his places. And so there was, there was the melding of the rhythm section going on last night, which was pretty cool to see. Mm -hmm. And Steve was, you know, I could tell it was kind of, you know, getting off on the, on the new opportunities to, to reinvent his parts in some ways. So that was kind of cool. Be careful of that though. That's the thing because you can have the entire band buy into this, this is great. Oh, these things that we, you know, just didn't do before or whatever. Well, you know, the old way did work. Yep. <laughs> yep. No, no, so, I, I, I know exactly. We, we played uh, Soul with a capital S last night. Yeah. And um, that's a good example. So uh, he, everyone played great. Mm -hmm. It felt different. And my response was felt kind of manic, you know, like, like everybody played, the, you know, well, but it felt like a lot of stuff was going on. Was this just different because a lot of stuff was not going on in the past and I just, I need to understand and feel it a little bit differently. So it, it's going to take a little while. And I think, that, you know, my band is pretty good at it. If something's not working, we talk about it and even, and either shelve it or fix it. Sure. Uh, but you know, you're right. And especially in a cover band or a band that's expected to make people dance, the proof is right there on the dance floor. So I would not say that as a band, we're going to be wrapped up in defending the purity of the original part, it, you know, at the end of the day, it's if the song goes over, right. That uh, is what's most important. That one would be the most obvious one to me. So again, it was kind of cool. There was really kind of skippy groovy things going on, whether the whole band needs some time to butter, you know, and make that kind of more complex groove uh, happen. Cause it is the, you know, it certainly works for tower of power. Why does it not work when a cover band tries to tackle it? Number of reasons, right? Are you, are we, are we, you know, for lack of a better phrase, are we too white, you know, to make yeah. some of that groove groove, right? Right. No, totally. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And I don't mean that, you know, as a, as a, you know, a, a racial stereotype thing, I sort of do, but I just mean like, you it's, know, it's efficient. Are we too stiff? Yeah, are we yeah. too stiff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a that's a term. Yeah, for sure. That's a term. It's a term. Yeah. No, and I'm that's gonna get more hate mail, aren't I? Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a feedback at giggabpodcast.com. <laughs> I don't I don't want to miss the hate mail, folks. <laughs> but um, it, it's uh, it, it it's true, right? You. It, but I've seen some bands where that works phenomenally well. I went and saw uh, Trey Anastasio played uh he's the guitar player from fish he's had his own band for a long time i went and saw him once a number of years ago and it was actually kind of awful his he and his band have gelled a whole lot better since then and I, I think i mentioned i saw him at the end of the summer and the band was phenomenal but i mean this band especially this drummer he's like that kind of player where he's very busy and 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 adding in all of these crazy things that no one uh, you know, very few people in the crowd would would even notice. It's possible people on stage aren't even noticing, right? I mean, they probably are. It's a pretty high caliber band, but um, yeah. But you know, like he's doing stuff that he doesn't need to do. And as a drummer, I'm totally into it. But you know, halfway through the gig, I remember looking around, thinking, okay, so this guy's found his way of playing all this stuff that that probably that does make the band happy, but also 
still works for the crowd. And, and you know, to, to perhaps to Trey Anastasio's credit, John Fishman, the drummer from Fish, very different drummer than than Russ Lawton, who was playing with Trey and his band. But same kind of thing. Fishman is one of the most complex drummers I've ever heard. But he knows what to do to make sure mm. there's a groove. And a lot of that is is simplifying, say, the bass drum pattern or the hi-hat pattern to give the people who are moving something to 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 cement themselves with. And then you can play kind of whatever you want all over that. But if you make everything crazy, well, then there's nothing left to to, you know, to stand on, so to speak, or to dance on. Yeah, it's it's uh, you could almost make the distinction. It's the difference between pocket and groove. So groove is what you do. Pocket is what you feel. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Pocket, you know, if you ever have those days where things are just flowing and you feel like you're not even doing anything because the flow is just so good, that's pocket. Right. Right. Groove is a, is a technical thing that you play. Uh, Yeah. I, I mean, OK. I mean, it, like, yeah, the words can mean a lot of different things. But, yeah, I I, I find that, yeah, the pocket, the pocket has to be there for people to dance to. That's that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you on that. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. All right. Yeah, man. You want to talk about set lists or you think we're good for today? Uh, you know what? I think we're good for today, my friend. We, we don't want to. We got over. a great question. Yeah, we'll bring it up next time. We got okay. a great question about structuring set lists um, from uh, our, our listener, Dan Ray in North Carolina. Dan, we'll get to your we'll get to your question because it's a really good one about set list design and controlling the energy in a room, driving the energy in a room. We'll do that next week, among some other things. But this is what happens. Like these conversations just flow because they just spark experiences. And, you know, just I just kind of like how we get to the place we're going to. And if you folks don't know, here's the way it works. Dave and I get online 30 seconds before we record. We do. And we're like, we what do you want to talk about today? Agenda. Yeah, <laughs> we don't follow it, but we do build in those in those 30 seconds before we record, though. Yeah. It's not like we have a like a like, what do we let's have a one hour meeting and talk about what we're going to talk about. You know, we just kind of let it flow. And the, the format seems to be working. We're getting a lot of great questions from guys. We should get back in this new year to getting a couple of interviews going. We had some success with that and people seem to yeah. like that. Yeah. So I think we should get back to that a little bit. But the the interaction both on our community board, on the Facebook page and more increasingly over email has been really great. I was telling Dave, we've actually had several people join the Facebook community lately. So it seems like word is getting out a little bit farther. So if you've shared about us, thanks a whole lot. Um, We're entering our, we're just about to complete what our third year of doing this, right? Yeah. Giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook, by the way, for those of you that want to get there, we made it it really easy. Just giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook. That's it. Yeah. So as we as we get ready to enter our fourth year, in, in, what in, in mid February I think we'll start our fourth year, right? Uh yeah, I think that's right. I think it was the beginning of February of 2015 when we finally released the first episode because it was at CES in, in where you sort of popped the uh, idea into my head uh, mm. or presented the idea to me, I should say, and then it was like, oh yeah, let's do that. Sounds let's good. do that. Let's and we've been do doing that. it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thanks, folks. It's really, it's uh, it's a pleasure. So, Happy New Year to you all. Make sure you're always, 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 always be performing. Happy New Year, everybody. Let's do it. Let's do it.